if you follow highway number four on Vancouver Island all the way to the end, when you meet the shores of the Pacific, you come to a T-junction in the road. And if you turn right, you'll end up in Canada's surf capital, Tofino. But if you turn left, you find yourself in the delightful little town of Euculet, which is where we're visiting this week. And we're gonna find out what kind of cool things Euculet has for a food community. Euculet has traditionally lived in the shadow of his famous neighbor at the other end of the Pacific Rim National Park coastline. But with easy access to the famous beaches, it is inevitably growing and changing from a fishing harbor to a destination resort. The recently opened Wild Pacific Trail gives visitors a chance to experience the ruggedness of this coast up close. And if you want to learn more about the ocean's inhabitants, Euculet Aquarium lets you get your hands wet with some of the local residents. What makes this aquarium different and special from other aquariums around the world? Um, for, for a lot of reasons. So the first is that we're a catch and release facility. Every season we start in February and March, we go collecting. We bring in only local species and only species that transition well to being in our facility. Um, and then at the end of our season, we begin doing releases. So we return things in November and December back to the places that we found them. We really believe in um, hands-on and really involved learning. So we have touch tanks. Uh, we have biologists on the floor all the time. So lots of education. And uh, yeah, we, we like to have a lot of fun. That's awesome. So yeah. what you're really saying is that not only can people come to Euculet for a holiday, but all your sea life here comes here for a holiday and then they go back into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> the food scene is changing here too with new restaurants opening, offering a much greater range of foods, including Hank's untraditional barbecue, where I asked co-owner Francois Pilon what makes Hank's untraditional. We make everything from scratch and we're not just linked to brisket, pulled pork and ribs, so okay. it's just like maybe you'll find other stuff, you know, um, like pork hock or like fresh seafood. And it's just the, basically we can do whatever we want with that name. Now we saw you putting some pork hocks in the, yeah. in the smoker. That looks fantastic, I have to say. Smoking takes a long time. Those briskets I was pulling out earlier, um, you know, they, they went in last night about midnight. Okay. And uh, so now what, they've, been, about they've been 12, resting 12, for- 12, 13 hours? Yeah, sometimes longer, but those okay. ones were a little ready, a little, they're, they're, sometimes they're ready, sometimes they're not. They all right. vary. We're looking for like rich, flavorful, bold, heavy, spicy, big portions. Right. This is what we like. So there's a lot of steps to what we do. Right. And maybe that's why I call it untraditional. Right. Euculet is growing as a tourist destination, and so it is gaining some new accommodations, including the stunning Black Rock Resort, right at the ocean's edge. David Schiaffino is the new chef at the resort, and he has promised me a barbecue to remember. We're going to start with the scallop, parmesan scallop. Okay. A little bit of uh, white wine. A little bit of butter, yes. This we're going to put 400 degrees for five minutes. Okay. I think the real food has to be simple because the flavors are already there. Some octopus is already uh, cooked and uh, marinated in herbs. My technique is this, put a, a potato the size of your fist yeah. with the octopus when you are boiling it. Yeah. When the potato is done, the octopus is done. Perfect. My grandma, I thought, I think, uh, taught me that. Right. I've done it for 25 years yeah. Yeah. and I have never had a tough octopus. Some roasted potatoes. Okay. We're just going to add this here. Chef David is from Peru, which is the indigenous home of the trusty potato. First time I, I came to Canada, I went to the market and I find six, seven varieties of potatoes. Yeah. No, and I was like, oh my God. Where's the rest? Where's the rest? <laughs> you know how many potatoes we have? A couple of hundred? Uh, 3,564. Wow. Oh, look at those guys there. A final thing, because we, I don't want to overcook it, but right. at the same time, I want a crispy layer here. Right. Huh? That's a beautiful dish. Oh dear. It's good. That's spectacular. Yeah. That's beautiful. Those scallops were just for starters. The potatoes and octopus are next. This just looks fantastic. Try to get both of the sauces, like yep. uh, yep. the red and the green one. The green is a little chimichurri, just to put a little color and a little bit more spice. Soft, melts. Mm -hmm. No, that's the, the, the thing of the octopus, it has to be like that, no? 
the first bite has to be consistent, and then the next two or three bites have to disappear. That's right. That's if right. you That's chew it more than seven times, Perfect. change cook. Yeah, yeah. Followed by local halibut on chimichurri mashed potatoes. Voila. Beautiful. It's good. I'll be back. I'll be back. And finally, a Peruvian saute. I do genuinely love the fact, David, that you are using that yeah. and that and stuff from over there. Yeah. All on the same place. It, it's... I come from far away, but I have to get married to this place. Right. No, I have to embrace this place, work with this place, learn from this place, and of course apply my techniques to this place. No? Yeah. 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 It is early the next morning and I'm out on the water. The west coast of Vancouver Island is famous for its weather. After all, they do call it a rainforest for a very good reason. But it's also famous for its seafood, including oysters. And we're off to harvest some of the finest in the world. Effingham Inlet off of Barkley Sound has beautifully clean and nutrient rich water, both of which provide ideal conditions for oyster cultivation. We're at the FUPSI, guys. It stands for Floating Upwelling System. Okay. So each one of these screens, there are bins, has a screen on the bottom. Yep. The water is pulled up into the middle and pushed out. Right. So it's just pulling water past the oysters. Yep. And these are the little guys. These are the babies. There's probably 600 oysters in this little scoop. Right, yeah. There's close to 10 million oysters in uh, these 14 bins behind us. Okay. So every week we're taking close to a quarter million oysters from here, putting them on the rafts. So this is your nursery? This is a nursery. Nice. So what's the growth cycle for these? How long will it take these to become marketable? Some of these ones will be ready in eight months. Right. Some will be ready in 36. Okay, depending on the size you want to grow them to. As you grow an oyster, you got a little one beside a big one. Big one takes all the food, the little one doesn't grow. Oh, okay. So we are constantly separating them. A short boat ride takes us to the next stage. The oysters are moved into trays, which are suspended in the crystal clear water. Here we have a tray of oysters that uh, they're about 12 months old. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have come out of the Flupsy August 3rd last year. Okay. And we've been through this tray four times now. So we'll go through, we'll harvest one like this, yeah. it's going to the restaurant. One like this, it's going back down. Okay. The surface waters here can get as warm as 23 degrees in the summer, but the inlet is a deep fjord, which can be very useful. When the water gets to 17 degrees, they're spawning. Right. They're, a Pacific oyster is not good when it's spawning. No, it's very, very milky and very sort of opaque and... Yeah, so what we've done is in the summer we've dropped all these darker blue ropes that are about 60 feet deep. Okay. The water down there is cold, there's less food, there's less sunlight. Right. It's, it's winter. Yeah. An oyster in December, January, February is in hibernation mode. Right. It's taking all its energy and putting it into stored fats and sugars. The okay. uh, oysters, they taste phenomenal that time of year. Yeah. After that visit, I'm ready to sample more of those oysters. Purely in the interest of quality control, of course. And the place to try them locally is Raven Lady Oyster Forte, a landmark open-air restaurant in the center of Eucula, owned by Bruce Schmaltz. Uh, I started off coming out to the Oyster Festival in Tofino. I started looking for an oyster farm, right. and thankfully I didn't get it because, as we've seen from Micah this morning, it takes a lot of work. An huh? enormous amount of work, isn't and, it? Yes. And then when I came down to Euclid, I saw the Raven Lady, and I fell in love. She was made in 1992 in uh, Tofino by the artist Mike Camp, okay. and then she was transported down to here. So when I came down here, I go, I'm a retired businessman, with that logo, I can build another company right. because she's so iconic. You're now focusing on the oyster, that beautiful, rich food from the sea. Well, where it tied together, she's a sensuous image. Yep. And you take one of the most sensuous foods I know Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Is the oyster. Now, my feeling was if we could put sensuous art with a sensuous food, right. we get a heightened experience. A heightened experience, eh? That sounds interesting.
Once head chef Mickey Fair got planned. So we're going to do a nice little uh, summer trio of oysters. We're going to do an oyster and halibut ceviche with okay. some beautiful uh, heirloom tomatoes. Nice. We're going to do some oysters with a pineapple, ginger and rum sorbet. And we're also <laughs> going to do some broiled oysters on the barbecue here with a uh, ponzu butter. Nice. I juiced a whole pineapple for the show. Yep. Equal parts brown sugar and water. Okay. Uh, quarter cup each. Yep. And some ginger. And okay. that's just been simmering. Okay, so down here I've got the churner. That's just been uh, pre-cooling. Now, people at home could do this as well in their freezer. Without, all you gotta do is just go in with a fork. That's Every correct. 15 or 20 minutes, give it a stir. Don't It'll you? be more like a granita, which is still just as nice yep. for the oysters. Yep. Got this little bit of salt paste? Yeah, a little bit of salt mix, just to hold the oysters up. Probably five parts salt to one part water. Okay. So we've got some nice little candy stripe beets, which we're gonna use the garnish on the uh, ceviche. We can start putting together the other ingredients for our ceviche. Okay. So we've just got those beautiful tomatoes. Yep. Uh, some nice little shallots that I diced earlier. Yeah, just a few of those freshly chopped chives. So our ceviche has been sitting for about 20 minutes. That just looks so fantastic. It's beautiful little chive flowers A little bit well. of chive flowers in there. Get a nice punch. So these are just the uh, oysters we shucked earlier. Yeah. Straight onto the barbecue. <clears throat> so the butter's are. Uh, Coming to the boil now, okay. just uh, add some lime juice. That was just a little bit of uh, soy sauce. Okay. Have you ever eaten uh, Vegemite, Steve? Oh, I have, I have. All right, so it's a little bit sour and a little bit salty. Yep. This is my way of slowly introducing people to Vegemite. Bringing people, bringing, bringing the ways bringing of, them the, into of the, the, fold. Antipi the Antipodean <laughs> cuisine into the North American culture. Okay, so these are uh, broiled oysters. They're looking pretty well done. So we're just going to uh, plate them up. Okay, and this butter's nice and hot. It's got beautiful flavor in it now. It's nice and foamy. And we're just gonna spoon that onto our oysters. Beautiful. So just a little recap on this one. So this was just simply the butter, yep. the liquid from the ceviche, That's the correct. lime juice, and a little bit of soy. That's it, very, very simple. Very, simple. And then we're just gonna go a dash of rum on these oysters. Oh, we're gonna go a little neat rum on there, good. And then we're gonna give it a little bit of this pineapple. <laughs> Beautiful pineapple oh, ginger. Well, now I've got my sea legs back. We're here in the studio kitchen with Jason Wolf, Director of Energy Solutions from Fortis, BC. Thanks very much for coming into the kitchen today, Jason. Pleasure to be here. So we are going to play around with some oysters and we're gonna do a little bit of indoor smoking. Indoor smoking, so indoor. a little bit of smoke detector little problem? Bit of, I hope no, not, I, I hope, hope not. not. We'll find out, it could be an adventure. Okay, let's go. Um, the key here is, is temperature control, which of course, you can talk a little bit about. Well, yeah, we you're, have, you're using a gas stove. So we have the perfect range. tool here to maintain the, the ideal temperature for, for keeping our smoke at a nice gentle level. So what we're gonna use today is apple wood chips. Okay, so they're a little bit smaller than, than some of your wood chips you can get for smoking, but because they're that bit smaller, they'll smoke a little bit quicker and at a lower temperature. Are so, these the same things I could get for barbecuing? And absolutely, doing that? absolutely, that's exactly what they are. But what I do wanna do is I just wanna wet them a little bit, okay? And again, that's just gonna control the heat. I've got my pot over on my burner. Don't use a pot that's got a nonstick coating or you know anything that's, that's really sort of delicate on the inside. This is just a regular old stainless steel pot. And if you just put a piece of foil on the bottom, as I say, that just prevents us from having to do a whole bunch of scrubbing afterwards. And then your chips, just get scattered. Pot's already hot, you got it all. Pot's wrapped. already hot, so there goes the, the moisture, the, the water's evaporating there. And we're just gonna let that do its thing for a couple of minutes, okay? We're using this, this natural gas burner here, which gives us that ability to control the heat. What else, you know, how versatile is gas for, for everybody else out there? Well, it's, it's obviously great for cooking. You're a chef, you know that. Yeah. It's great for barbecuing too. You can bring Absolutely. it a, a line out to your barbecue and then there's no more lugging around those big propane tanks. Partway through a dinner party, you run out of the propane, right. off to the store you go, none of that. Yeah. And of course, then your normal uses of natural gas, so heating your, your hot water, your home, right. And, uh, and it's clean and safe and yep. uh, affordable. That's great, that's great. Now, what we've got here, if we look into the bottom of the oven, you can just see some of the chips are starting to char. 
mm -hmm. okay, the ones that are in direct contact right at the bottom. And we're starting to get, if you, if you sort of stick your face in there, you can start to smell that, yeah, that slightly not as much smoky steam flavor. anymore. I'm starting to smell it a little bit. Exactly. So what we're going to do now is we can just, and I'll, I'll give you to do a couple of these. We're just going to put our oysters, and the beauty is, of course, they will just sit on top of the wood chips. So if I could just get you to place those in, and they, I think we've got enough room in the pot there, and we just rest those on top of the wood chips, and then quite simply, on goes the lid. Ta-da! You're smoking. Yeah, and you can do this in your home. Absolutely. What you don't want is that thick, dark, bitter, acrid smoke. You want the soft, delicate, especially with something like oysters. You want to have something that's that's more subtle, more delicate. Right. So this is the idea here that you could control that. Now we've got the opportunity to raise and lower the gas and, and give us just that right amount of heat in there. We're doing an escabeche here. We're going to smoke it first and then we're going to put the oysters into our lime juice. Julienne carrots. Julienne carrots. So what I want to what I'm going to get you to do for me is make me some julienne carrot, <laughs> just like that. I, I don't get, know if mine are going to turn out quite the same. I'll show you. I'll show you how. I'll show you how to do it. The easiest way is to, and my first tip, don't have the carrot too long. If you try and do this with a big long strip of carrot, you'll find that it bends and twists as the knife goes through it. So keep them relatively short. That's about four or five centimeters long, maybe two inches, in in length. The carrot's not very stable. So we're just going to take a little thin strip, two, two little slices. Now we've got a nice stable piece of carrot. Now we can make those cuts nice and fine, okay? And then the next step is not to take too many slices at a time. Nice claw with the fingers. And then I just use the claw and just gently drop the knife down. You notice the tip of the knife never lifts up off the board. And I'm using the back side of the knife. And there we go. There's our julienne and the carrot. So there you go. All right, we got we're gonna let we're gonna let you left-handed here. Okay, that's it. Slide your knife forward further so that you're just using the very very back of the knife. That's it. Not bad. Not bad, bad at all. Not, not bad. bad at all. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna shred our savoy cabbage. So just take a chunk off of there like so. Drop it down nice and flat. You can bring that one through, and again, quarter of this is gonna give us more than we need. Everything's attached to the core in the center there, so we'll just lose that. And then it's a little big to be working with, so I'm just going to cut it one more time in half. And then this one here, much as we did with the carrots, except I'm going to leave everything in place. Once again, just nice, very, very fine cuts using that back part of the knife. And that'll give us that nice, super fine chiffonade. Now, this is a julienne, okay? This is a chiffonade. And the difference being that your julienne will come from a, a, a solid vegetable. Most of your root vegetables are done into julienne. Your chiffonade, although it's a similar type of shape, is coming from a leaf. Now while we're talking, if we have a little peek over here, you can see our, our smoker is doing its thing. We're going to drop the temperature down because now we're getting quite a bit of smoke. So we're going to yeah, drop that, that temperature right now. Kind of smells like an apple tree. Just That's starting sorry. to smell like an apple tree. And if we just lift that off, you can just see the very, very bottom is starting to smoke on the, yeah. on the yeah, apple there's chips. There's a bit more steam now. That's right. And of course, that's, that's coming from the oysters. oysters. And what we're looking for, this one here is already starting to open. These guys are just starting to pop. So we're going to give them probably, there we go, that one just popped on us. This works great on the barbecue as well. Right. You can just stick your whole oysters right on top of the barbecue. And as soon as they're cooked, they pop right open. This is all going to go into our bowl with a little bit of our julienne of carrot here. And then we're just going to give this a little bit of our lime juice. And as I say, this is the dressing. So it's just like... You I mean, there's nothing in that. There's just, just lime just juice. Straight lime straight juice. Lime. The acid in the lime juice just starts to break down the cabbage a little bit. So that will... There we go. And put that one over there. Now, if I can get you to dice that tomato for me, please. I Meanwhile, I'm going to take care of the oysters over here because they are cooked. So if you've got a customer who wants to go to gas, how can they do that if they don't already have it? Well, it's actually quite easy. You can go on our website, you can call our 1-800 number, and in many cases, it's only gonna cost you $25 to hook up to gas. Oh, wow, that's very affordable. Well, we, we also are you know, quite concerned about efficiency and we want you to use gas in the most efficient way, so we have a number of programs too okay. that you can uh, partake in and we'll give you rebates uh, on equipment and, and gas appliances so you can get that more efficient appliance. 
So some of them are a little, little tough, so we just have to help them along. Once again, I don't want to overcook them, but I, you can see how those oysters are just so beautifully cooked in the, in the shell. And now this is, this is the escabeche part. Put it in the lime, and that just sort of finishes the cooking process. There we go, I'll pass that back to you. Then we're gonna add some of our tomatoes. Put a little bit of the raw shallots in there. There we go. And a little of the jalapenos, please. You want this kind of thing to give you that, that little bit of heat, but you don't wanna, you know, make it too hot. This is all about subtlety and some nice delicate flavors. Just give it a little bit of a stir around. We'll give it a little bit of, a little bit of sea salt. Just a little pinch of white pepper there. A little bit of a stir. Okay, and then we're just gonna let them sit for, you could let them sit for up to half an hour, but really after 10 minutes, they're pretty well good to go. Smoked oysters are one of my favorite West Coast morsels. They're just decadent. But the smokiness and the richness of the oyster, you've got to be quite conscious about what you're pairing. I've chosen the Damasco from Zanata. The Zanata winery is located in the Cowichan Valley, and it's actually the oldest winery on the island. There's a minerality to it that I think will really hold up well to the smokiness and the richness of the oysters. Now for the beer pairing, I've chosen Spinnaker's Cascadia Dark Ale, otherwise known as CDA. CDA is my go-to beer when it comes to rich, smoky foods, a lot of stuff that comes off the barbecue. The style of CDA is a black IPA. So what that means is it has a nice hoppy body uh, that you would expect from an IPA, but there's an equal amount of dark roasted maltiness. And I think it's that maltiness that will be the perfect complement to this West Coast delicacy.